Hello, everyone, and welcome to Afternoons with the Author, hosted by Syosset Public Library. My name is Donna, and I am a Reader Services Librarian here at Syosset. And I am joined by Evelyn, a fellow Reader Services Librarian. Say hi, Evelyn. Hello, everybody. We are so excited to have author Alka Joshi joining us today. Alka is the author of the 2020 debut novel, The Hannah Artist. It was a Reese Witherspoon Book Club pick and Publishers Weekly called The Hannah Artist an eloquent debut. Joshi's evocative descriptions capture India's sensory ambience, drawing readers deep into her moving story. Joshi masterfully balances a yearning for self-discovery with the need for familial love. Okay then, just a few technical details before we get started. Today's program will be held in Zoom webinar mode. So you're not able to see or uh, we are not able to see or hear you. To ask a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A option provided through Zoom. Depending on your device, this option can typically be found at the bottom of your screen. You just tap or click on the Q&A option and type in your question or comment. And Evelyn and I will read it aloud. The chat option has been disabled for today's event. On behalf of the Reader Services Department, we are so glad you have joined us today. And please help us welcome author Alka Joshi. Alka? Hi, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. I am happy to be with you all, even if I can't see you. You know, this is one of the great things about the pandemic. And uh, I know that sounds strange, but it's wonderful to be able to talk to people all around the world because of the technical capabilities uh, that we have now. So uh, I'm out in California and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my journey to publication with the henna artist because a lot of people say, oh, you've been an overnight success. But uh, in reality, it took me 10 years to bring the book to publication. And I just kept thinking the whole time, please don't let me die before this book becomes a reality in people's hands. Um, so in 2008, I had been running my advertising and marketing agency for a couple of decades, and we were on to another recession. This time it was the mortgage crisis. And I knew that recessions in my business, it takes about two years for the business to come back full force because that's just um, the way that recessions go. And so I thought, okay, during those two years, what can I do with myself? And my husband had been encouraging me to go full time into an MFA program in creative writing because he said, I know you do ads. I know that you write and create these stories on radio and television. Uh, but I think that you could do long form fiction. So I thought, okay, why not? I'll enroll in an MFA program. So from 2009 to 2011, that's what I did. And that is where the henna artist uh, was conceived. Now, uh, at the same time, my younger brother had bought a condo in Jaipur, which is where my family is from and which is a place that my family lived before we came to the United States. So, um, I was taking my mother back and forth to this condo. My mother would say, leave me here for a couple of months and uh, why don't you go back and finish your semester, come back during a break and then come pick me up. And of course, during that time, I would spend two to three weeks with her in Jaipur going back and forth. Uh, and we had a chance to spend time together in a way that I hadn't spent time with her since I was 18 years old and went away to college. So uh, we're talking about all kinds of things. We are going to her old school. We're meeting with the headmistress, the current headmistress there. Uh, I am learning about my mother's, uh, uh, the fruit that she loved to get that she couldn't get in the United States. And we go to the market uh, for that. We go to the bazaars uh, in Jaipur. We look at the sari stores. We go to jewelry stores. And along the way, I'm asking her, what was it like for you, mom, uh, before the kids were born, before you were married? Uh, you know, what was your life like? What did you read? Uh, wh who were your friends? And so in doing all of that, one thing that occurred to me is that my mother didn't have the options, the choices in life that she always gave me in order to live out my destiny. Um, she was at the age of 18 in college studying psychology and her father said, you need to come back home. You need to get married. Um, 18 is pretty long for us to have waited uh, to get you uh, a husband. And uh, we have found this great uh, engineer. He's young and promising and fabulous. And so you need to come back and get married. 
So my mother, having met him only the one time that she came back home, uh, was then walking seven times around the fire in marriage to my father. And uh, sure enough, you know, he was a promising engineer. He was constantly getting promoted or transferred around the state of Rajasthan. But he was one of those young engineers who was helping rebuild the country after uh, the, the post-independence uh, era. So uh, my mother then quickly was having three children in four years and then moving house so many times, five times in India before we left for America. And then in 10 years time after their marriage, my father said, okay, I think I wanna go study abroad. I wanna get my doctorate in this particular field. It's only being done in Germany and in the United States. And we ended up in Iowa at Iowa State University uh, my brothers and I are like 8, 10, and 11 years old. So there we are in uh, Iowa. And, you know, I just, I realized that during all of this time, my mother did not have any agency over her own life. She was always being commanded either by her father or my father about all of uh, the things that were happening in her life. So I thought, what if I could give her a life in fiction as Lakshmi, a henna artist, uh, a woman who is having a very independent life. What if I could give her that life that she didn't get to have in reality? So that is the genesis of where this whole idea came from. My mother was not a henna artist. She had, of course, a lot of henna done on her hands. And when I was a little girl in India, I would see her with henna on her hands, getting prepared for a festival or a wedding. And I would say, oh, mom, I want that too. And so she would have the henna artist apply it on my hands as well. So that was my, uh, you know, sort of introduction to henna at a very, very, very young age. Um, so then I finished the henna artist as my MFA thesis. Now it's 2011. My mother is present at my thesis reading. She says, honey, this is really good. I'm so glad you're working on this. It's great. You should keep going. Well, eight months after my presentation, my mother died unexpectedly. So I was grieving so much that I couldn't even look at the manuscript for another two years. And after that time, one of my thesis advisors called me and Anita said, what happened to that book that you were working on uh, during your MFA tenure? Why don't you bring it out? Let's work on it and let's see if we can get it published. So she went and uh, sent off the manuscript to her agent. And her agent called me within a few days and said, oh my God, I love the book. I love Lakshmi. I love the whole concept of henna. Let's work on this and get it published. And I was like, oh great, when are we going to publish it? And she goes, oh, Alka, we have to do some work on it first. Well, four and a half, five years later, we're still working on this book. Uh, now, you know, the recession is over, my business is back up and I am working full time, but still I'm like, Emma, when are we ever going to get this book published? And she goes, oh, I've taken you as far as a literary agent can take you. Now you need to find yourself a developmental editor to help you really flush out the book so that we make it the best debut it possibly can. At the time, I remember I was really frustrated with my literary agent, Emma Sweeney, because I thought, why is she keeping the book from sending it out to publishers? I always wanted her to send it out. And she kept saying, you only get one chance to have a debut novel and we want it to be the best it can possibly be. It's like you only have one chance to make a first impression, right? So um, I found myself a developmental editor. I sent off the manuscript. She, she gave it back to me. Now, what I'm expecting, of course, is a letter from her saying, this, this novel is so ready to be published. <laughs> Your literary agent doesn't know what she's talking about. But that is not what Ronit said. Ronit said, this uh, is a good manuscript and we need to make it better by following these uh, you know, 40,000 suggestions that I have. And I was so upset because I thought, hey, this is my book. This is a piece of fiction. Why does everybody else get to tell me what is wrong with it? And uh, you know, I think my ego got in the way and I just thought, I am not working on this book anymore. Forget it. Uh, and it's been about seven years now that I have been working on this. So I just put the book away. Another year goes by and I run across the manuscript and this time I just start reading it, you know, just, just for pleasure. And I'm reading it and I think, oh, 
I miss this world. I miss Lakshmi. I miss Malik and Radha. I want to go back into this world of Jaipur in the 1950s. What is this all about? So I pulled out the uh, instructions from the editor, all of those summary pages that she had given me, 12 to 15 pages of comments, and I start looking at them. And this time, because I've been away from them for a whole year, I'm able to see that she is making sense in what she is telling me to do with characters, with scenes, with the overall arc of the story. And so I get to work again. Now I send the manuscript back to Emma after editing it. And I said, Emma, please, it's been nine years since I first started this manuscript. Could we please send it off to an editor? And this time Emma says, okay. So she sends it off and HarperCollins ends up buying it. And HarperCollins is so excited about this book. They say this is going to be a really big book of 2020 for us. So we have 18 months to get it all together. Here's your new editor, Kathy. And she has some things that she wants you to work on. So now I have even more things that I need to do with the manuscript. But, you know, I'm so close to my goal that I, I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to hunker down and make these changes. And I did. And I'm so grateful now after the 10-year journey to have listened to my agent, to my editors, uh, to uh, all of my reviewers, because everybody helped make this book what it is today. This is the 30th version of the book that you are reading right here. It took that long and that much persistence and that much patience to get to this point. Now, uh, March 2020 is slated as my release date. Uh, HarperCollins has done an amazing job of getting the book out to bookstores, uh, all the independents, uh, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, libraries, um, Target, Walmart, all these other locations. They are so excited for this book release. And then the pandemic comes. And one by one, every single one of my book events is canceled. Every single one. I don't have a chance to talk to one person about this book. And I just thought, shoot me now, just kill me now. Because I spent 10 years working on this book. This is a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And we are so ready for this. We are so prepared for this launch and we don't get to talk to anybody about it. Amazon even has stopped shipping out books because they're only gonna ship out essential supplies like toilet paper and paper towels. So we are completely hosed. And I just thought, okay, I'm just gonna go to bed and I'm never gonna, gonna come out again. I told my husband, I am not coming out again. Well, about a week later, uh, I get a call from my editor at HarperCollins, Kathy. And Kathy says, Alka, are you sitting down? Because I have some news for you. I said, well, I'm actually lying down. <laughs> and she said, uh, Reese Witherspoon has picked your book for May and she's gonna announce it on May the 1st. And you need to spend the next four to five weeks working with her people to make sure that we have content for their social media. And I am like, oh my God, really? Reese Witherspoon has picked my book? I was completely floored. It was like the last thing on the planet I thought was going to happen. Any major star like Reese Witherspoon would pick my book for her book club. Oh my God. So yes, I got to work with her people and it was really a wonderful experience because they are all so warm and so respectful. So we worked on a couple of cooking videos. I uh, had my older brother put together a cocktail for uh, the book called the Maharani Cocktail uh, in honor of the older Maharani who likes to feed her orchids gin and tonics. <laughs> um, and then uh, let's see, we also did um, book, uh, an articles about mom's saris, mom's jewelry. Um, I took out all of these old photos of my mother and started posting them on social media. And um, so that was a really great experience before the May 1st uh, announcement that Reese made. And so then I got to have my little video chat with Reese and she's so kind and I owe her such a deep sense of gratitude for uh, giving my book new life during a pandemic. I mean, it could have just died. I don't know what would have happened to it otherwise, uh, but because uh, she loved the book and she wanted to talk about it, it was really an amazing thing to have happen. 
Then suddenly the book starts climbing, of course, all of the New York Times bestseller lists, LA Times, Toronto Star, Globe and Mail, USA Today. And then suddenly the uh, screen adaptation companies start calling. Now I was kind of floored also by this because I thought that the adaptations for movies and TV shows only came along after the book had been out for a couple of years. Because by then they would know sales figures, they would know that the book was going to do well around the world. Uh, but you know, by then we already had so many countries who had ordered the book. Uh, they had bought it for the foreign rights and they, it was being translated into 23 languages. So I think the um, producers in Hollywood got a chance to figure out, okay, you know what? We, we really like this book and we think that it, it can do well with a global audience. So now my uh, literary agency in New York contracts with a, an agency in LA called the Gotham Group and uh, Ellen Goldstein, who is the fabulous CEO of the Gotham Group, asks me, would you like to see the henna artist as a movie or as a TV series? And I said, oh, okay, you know what? I actually have an answer to this because I, as I write, I am an artist, first of all, in my heart and also just in my sensitivity. And so I see everything as a scene before I actually write it down on paper. Uh, so when I see the scene, it feels very cinematic. And so I saw this always as a TV series, something that could just continue season after season with all of these characters that I've created. So I wanted to have a bingeable TV series the way that I like to binge on Netflix or you know Amazon or Hulu or whatever. So uh, I said, I would love to see a TV series out of this. She said, okay. She went back to all of the inquiries and, they, and she said, the author would like to see a TV series proposal. So that is what we got from a bunch of different people. And I chose the package that came with Frida Pinto starring as Lakshmi and Michael Edelstein uh, being uh, also an executive producer on the project. Michael Edelstein oversaw the production of Downton Abbey when he was in charge of NBC Universal in England. And so he always saw this, uh, the henna artist, when he read it, he fell in love with it. And he's the one who sent it off to Frida and said, this is a great project for us and you should star in this. He fell in love with it uh, because he really sees the henna artist as an Indian Downton Abbey. So, oh my God, when somebody tells me that, I'm all over that. <laughs> I want it to be in Indian Downton Abbey. I want it to be lush and cinematic and uh, just gorgeous with uh, you know, the background of Jaipur, the palaces, uh, the street scenes, Lakshmi uh, walking around doing her henna. I wanna see all of that cinematically. So that's what we're working on now. And uh, as it happens, last December, my agent sent off some of the pages I've been working on for a sequel. And uh, Mira Books, HarperCollins bought it right away. So the sequel is actually coming out this year. So uh, the sequel comes out in June and it's called The Secret Keeper of Jaipur and we advanced the story 10 years. And then next year, uh, I'm currently researching and working on the third part of the trilogy, which will take place in France. And Radha is going to be a perfumer in France uh, as we meet up with her in the 1970s. So that's where I am right now, you guys. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, that's been my trajectory, my journey so far. Uh, and now I'm just a full-time author. So I have hung up my marketing shingle, although the marketing has really helped me a lot with the book. Like I, I understand, you know, how to, how to market. I understand how to, uh, you know, talk about the book. I've made so many presentations to clients over the years, so many presentations to boardrooms that, you know, this is kind of second nature to do a lot of this stuff. And this time I get to do it about my passion project for my mother, the henna artist. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Could you just give people a short little synopsis of what the book's about for those who have not read it yet? Absolutely. Thank you. So we meet up with Lakshmi, who is a 30-year-old woman living in Jaipur. She makes her living on the surface as a henna artist. What we don't know is that she also makes her living uh, at the other end of the spectrum. But 
Uh, I'm not going to give too much of that away. Uh, so we meet up with her and what she is doing is she is building a house. She tells us, uh, the reader, that she is building this house to atone for what she did all those years ago, 13 years ago, when she deserted her marriage, her arranged marriage, to a young man named Hari. She deserted that marriage because he was abusing her. And uh, she found a way to escape. She found a way to make a living as a henna artist, which was pretty remarkable at that time in 1950s India. Uh, she has also found a way, since she has moved so far from her village, to keep her past a secret. But at the start of the novel, the husband has caught up to her. And he has brought with him another surprise, which is a sister uh, she didn't know she had. Uh, the sister was born the year that she deserted her marriage. So there's a 17 year gap between Lakshmi and her sister Radha. So we are going to find out during the course of the novel what it's like for a 30 year old to raise a 13 year old and then all of the conflicts that come with that sister relationship. And it's more really of a mother daughter relationship as it turns out. Uh, but then also we're going to find out how is Lakshmi going to deal with the uh, coming of this husband whom she doesn't want to tell anybody she deserted because as a woman in the 1950s in India and probably still today it would be the same, uh, a woman who deserted her, her marriage is a persona non grata and she doesn't want to be known as that. She has let people believe that her husband deserted her, which gives her a modicum of sympathy from all of her elite women whom she uh, takes care of. Now, in, in, uh, as we uh, progress in the henna artist, we also find out that she is serving the Maharani's. And so we get to learn a little bit about the Jaipur Maharani's of the time. And I put so much research into finding out what palace life was all about, what these Maharani's did, what they had agency over and what they didn't have agency over. So that was really fun for me. And then, of course, in all of this, and much to my surprise with my readers, one of, the, um, uh, one of the characters in the book that people seem to love more than any, anybody is Malik. And Malik is Lakshmi's eight or nine-year-old helper. He doesn't know how old he is, but he prefers to be eight, he'll tell you. Um, and he remains loyal to Lakshmi. He and Lakshmi uh, go hand in hand, like whatever Lakshmi does, uh, Malik supports and whatever Malik does, Lakshmi supports. Uh, so that was a really fun relationship for me to explore between a Hindu and a Muslim. Uh, so that is the genesis of uh, this particular story. And I can also talk a little bit about, um, I think where I was going with this story. So as you know, I wrote it so that my mother would have a life in fiction, a life full of agency that she didn't have in reality. And what I wanted to, of course, portray is this larger message of the, the, uh, the very core belief that I have, that all women deserve agency over their lives. My mother gave me a tremendous gift very early on. She said, honey, you will get to decide whom you marry, what you choose to do with your life, uh, whether you choose to have children, how many you choose to have, whatever you want to do with your life is your own. You get to decide that. And what a gift for a mother to give her daughter. And so, uh, you know, for me, it has always been paramount for every woman in this world to be able to be given that gift, to have the agency uh, over her life and her destiny. So that's my larger sort of message with this. But then as I uh, went through the 10 years, progressing more and more into the story, going deeper and deeper into the Indian politics of the time and the, the social uh, sort of mores of the time, I actually ended up writing more of a love letter to India as a, as a subtext of the henna artist. And I can talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, that was a really wonderful thing that came out of it for me. Thank you so much. We have some questions from our participants here. The first one's from Jessica and she says, television seems to be the golden standard for book adaptations these days. Why do you think that is? 
Number one, I think it's because um, of the pandemic, you know that uh, streaming is up like, you know, fourfold, right? Because we can't go to the theater. We can't, we can't seem to, to uh, you know, go to the movies the way that we used to. And so streaming services have really benefited from our lockdowns and right away they are looking for content like crazy because more and more people are signing up for streaming services. They can watch a show whenever they want. They can stop in the middle. They can go on to another show. They have a lot of choices in genres and a lot of choices within those genres. So I think that that is one reason why TV has become, uh, you know, sort of the platform of choice, but also because in a book, you have so much going on in a book. You have many layers that are going on. In the henna artist, you have the layer of the story itself with the characters. Then you have another layer of the politics of India at the time, eight years after independence. Then you have another layer of the caste and social uh, classes and uh, you know what's happening within those at that time. And so there's so many different layers. Well, then there's another layer of Eastern medicine versus Western medicine uh, that we really get into with the henna artists. So um, because of all of those layers, I think a 90 minute movie is uh, not gonna do justice to such a layered uh, story. And so a TV series does much more of that. You can get far more into all of the different, uh, uh, you know, depths depths of the story. So I, I think that's why TV has become the, uh, you know, the mainstream platform for book adaptations. Where are you at in terms of filming or still writing the screenplay? You know, so I am not actually writing the screenplay. Oh, okay. I am, <laughs> I am an executive producer on the show, which means that I have this sort of exalted little position uh, without a whole lot of responsibility. So I will be in the writer's room. I will have an opportunity to read the scripts that they are putting together and an opportunity to say, oh, that character would never say it like that. They would say it like this. Or here is an, a, an opportunity to add in a scene between these two scenes that you have put together that might uh, explain a little bit more about what's going on uh, you know, uh, in the background. So I get a chance to contribute to the scripts, but I'm not actually writing the scripts because I don't know how to write screenplays. That's not something that I know. However, here is my goal, people. <laughs> my goal is that I am gonna be a fly on the wall as uh, this production is uh, moving forward. And I wanna learn as much as I can about this business so that for the sequel and then the third book in the trilogy, I might get to write the screenplay. So I definitely wanna learn from this process because I think that there is no barrier to learning. You can learn at any age, you can, um, reinvent yourself at any age. I mean, look at me, I'm 62. And now I'm starting a full time career as an author. So I and I've done this many times in my life, I have reinvented my career. Uh, because I just think it's, you know, it's so much fun to learn something new and to get good at something else. Uh, while we're still here. That's the whole reason for us existing is we get to learn new things, we get to pass on knowledge to other people, and so that they can advance themselves too. Okay, um, oh, oh, Karen. And, uh, so to answer the other part of your question, um, uh, right now they are going to write episodes. Uh, they are going to look for more money from all of the different streaming platforms. They have to decide which streaming platform they're going to be on. Um, they also are going to do casting uh, and figure out what the locations are going to be. So hopefully the production, the actual filming will start in 2022. Uh, so that's kind of how, how these things go. Uh, I know it seems sometimes like they get done overnight, but it's not overnight. It takes a while for all of that uh, to get done. It takes several years. Very exciting. Okay, we have a lot of questions here. Lou, Lou, Lovey, I guess, or Louvie, I'm sorry. I want, she just wants to say that she finished the book last night in one sitting. She's a bit sleep deprived today, but worth wow. it. I absolutely loved it. Eagerly looking forward to the next two books and the TV adaptation. So 
Oh, thank you. I love hearing that. You know, one of the biggest joys to me is to hear from readers. And it, this is why in the acknowledgement sections, I actually allowed a, um, I put in a contact for me. And readers from all over the world have been using that contact in the acknowledgements to get to me and say, hey, you know, I like the book or I have a book club. Can you talk to my book club? Or, you know, I have this article I'm writing about literature by women, uh, historical fiction, will you be a part of that? And I am game for all of that stuff, you guys. I just think in the pandemic, while I'm locked down, I am your captive audience. <laughs> Whatever you want to do is fine with me. Okay, Stacy says the covers of the henna artist and the secret keeper of Japar are gorgeous. Did you have a lot of influence in the cover design? Um, you know, I'd love to be able to tell you yes, but as it turns out, I offered my services uh, to HarperCollins and I said, hey, you know, I've been in advertising and marketing. How about, you know, I have some ideas for the cover. And they said, yeah, no, we, we got this. We don't need you to do this. We have a whole art department dedicated to creating covers where people will be compelled to pull the book off the shelf. So I said, okay, fine. And uh, then they sent me a PDF with four covers, four potential covers for the henna artist. And I was so scared to open it because I thought, what if I don't like any of them? So I said to my husband, come here, come here, come here. Uh, you know, be standing right by me as I open up this PDF. <laughs> so he was standing right there and I opened it up. And this was number one, the first cover that I opened up and it was gorgeous. And I fell in love with it. And I thought, this is it because this is the color of henna. This is the Japper palace. It's a woman coming out of the palace. So it could be Lakshmi after she has served one of the Maharani's uh, with henna. So that really, um, you know, kind of spoke to me immediately. So that became the cover for this. Now for the secret keeper of Japper, the sequel, um, I thought, wouldn't it be beautiful if we had the blue room uh, in the Japper palace as the setting. So this one is going outside of the palace. The other one is inside the palace because, um, and the blue room is gorgeous. It's a Wedgwood blue with white uh, detailing. It's, it's absolutely stunning. So there is a woman sitting inside the blue room. Now, uh, uh, one of the things that is happening in the second novel is that Malik as a 20 year old is uh, has an apprenticeship at the Japper Palace. And so he is working inside the palace, which is why we needed to be inside the palace. And he uh, is going to find out some secrets that he has to decide, is he going to disclose them or is he going to keep them to himself? So, yeah, so um, Har the, you know what? HarperCollins, Harlequin uh, Trade Publications, they do a beautiful job on book covers. I never even have to get involved. And this is, I think, part and parcel of being an author. You learn what, uh, what things you need to stand your ground on and what things you really need to let go of. And I've learned to let go of all of the things that everybody else is much better at than I am. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Let me go um, with another question. Um, this is a little different. Someone says, what was it like as a young Indian immigrant living in Iowa? Oh, great question. Thank you so much for that question. Because sometimes, um, you know, I think, uh, I think a lot of immigrants can relate to this. So I come to the, the United States and I think at that time I was nine and you know, we came into Ames, Iowa, where there weren't a lot of brown people. And so for a long time, my brothers and I were the only brown people in our classes. Um, and what is interesting are the kind of questions that we were asked. Um, oh, I love your tan. Uh, you know, where have you been to get that tan? Well, it's just the color of my skin. Uh, and then they would ask, oh, you're Indian. So what tribe are you? Uh, another question they might ask is, "What? Well, oh, you're from India. Well, what about all of those poor people in India? You know, how do you feel about those? Well, as a kid, when you're 9, 10, 11 years old, you don't know how to answer those kinds of questions. Those are big world questions. And as a kid, all I knew was, you know, I wore this uniform to school. Uh, I was uh, taught by Christian nuns who taught us English all day long. 
and we had one hour of Hindi grammar, uh, just like people have English grammar, you know, these days uh, in school. And, uh, you know, that I read English books and Hindi books and all kinds of books. So uh, the impression I was left with as a kid going to school in America, really in the heartland of America, because after Iowa, we were in St. Louis, and then we were in Kansas City. And then I said, I have got to go on one of the coasts in order to find more diversity in my life. So um, the thing that struck me that I came away with was that uh, the impression that people had of India was one of scarcity, illiteracy, uh, starving people, uh, cows running around in the streets and so on. And it was a negative impression overall. So I think for a long time, I didn't even want to be Indian. I, I just, I didn't want to tell people I was from India. I didn't want to hear those questions over and over again. But of course, you know, the color of my skin and the name that I have, my name gives me away right away. And people are always like, where are you from? So um, I was not happy to be Indian until I found a language, until I found this book, until I found a way to talk about my country. And as I kept uh, researching more and more about that past, as I was talking to my parents about their lives during independence and after independence, because they were teenagers and then in their 20s after independence, um, they were married in 1955. And uh, as I was also reading books and looking at movies from that era, I realized, wow, I come from an amazing culture. I come from a, from a culture that has survived um, centuries of domination by the other. So India has been dominated uh, by so many different people, not just the British for over 200 years, but also Mughal Empire ruled India for four or five centuries. And then we of course had so many Europeans invading India across the North for the silks and the spices and the gold that India had to offer. There was so much raping and pillaging of India going on over all of these centuries. And yet look at India today. It is a master powerhouse, an intellectual powerhouse. And wherever Indians go in the global diaspora, they become the doctors and the um, uh, uh, engineers and the scientists and the mathematicians. And now they're getting into politics and the media. You know, they try to contribute positively wherever they end up in this world. So um, I have great pride now in my heritage and I'm very proud to say, yes, I'm from India. Uh, and I think that so much uh, of what I'm trying to do in the henna artist is to give people an, a, a, um, uh, a vision of my India. This is the India I came from. This is the India of Rajasthan, uh, of that era of people who actually did read <laughs> books and read Jane Eyre and, and looked at Life and Look magazines and um, you know, came from a place where you have these stat stratifications of the domestic servants and you also have these um, you know, upper caste and upper class people who are um, sort of dominating everybody else's lives. So I wanted to definitely bring so much of that out. And um, I'm proud of arts like henna that India has been promoting for 5,000 years. Um, I'm proud of all of the work that has been done with jewelry. You know, Jaipur is the gem capital of the world. That is where so many gems are cut because the artisans there know how to do that. And of course, uh, you know that scene in The Henna Artist where Lakshmi is dancing around her room and she has designed this mosaic floor that is so patterned, uh, just like the henna that she puts on women's hands. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about those people who built all of those amazing palaces that the Mughals put up. Those were artisans that were brought over from all of the surrounding countries. The best of the best came to Jaipur to work on these kinds of buildings. So, uh, you know, this is what I was saying earlier about the henna artists became my love letter to India. That is just great. Um, Marla says, how would you compare the caste system in India with racism in the United States? She also wants to know she loved your book. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you know, I have not had a chance to read Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, but I heard her talking on Terry Gross. And my, um, my first thought when I heard her speak is I thought, oh, finally, somebody has written a book about the fact that cultures, even American culture has uh, a caste system. All cultures throughout the world have a caste system, whether they call it caste or not. And I agree with Isabel Wilkerson. I think that yes, uh, racism or the color of skin does create a caste system in the United States. You know, our gardeners, our housekeepers, uh, you know, the people who serve us tend to be largely uh, in a, a different color, uh, skin color than uh, the people who are actually hiring these folks. Uh, it's the same thing in India and caste is still unfortunately a dominant force in India. Caste is looked upon as a way to get jobs, as a way to increase your uh, status in society, as a way to um, uh, uh, um, get a good marriage proposal. Uh, you know, in 2019, I made a trip through five cities in India in the North, South and the West. And uh, what I found were newspapers. Whenever I would open up the Hindustani Times or the Times of India, there are marriage sections in India. And in the marriage section, uh, the inquiries are divided according to caste. That is how prevalent the entire caste system is in India. Uh, but I did also find in 2019 an article about a woman who is a lawyer and at the age of 39, she had been fighting for nine years and finally got a chance Can to- have a page, please, for the children? Through the courts, <laughs> she had a chance to uh, get a um, uh, certificate that says she is of no caste and no religion. It took her nine years to fight for that. So you could imagine how difficult it must be in India to get rid of this idea of the caste system. Uh, I do think that uh, it's important in, in India to um, distinguish between the caste system here with all of these 25,000 subcastes and five major castes. Um, and the socioeconomic level of all of these people. So, you know, um, one of the best things that happened in India was that the Dalits, the untouchable caste, was um, able to take advantage of the quota system in universities in India. So the universities had to have a certain number of uh, people in the Dalit caste who could uh, come to university. So they've had a chance to become educated just like affirmative action in the United States. Uh, and so, you know, you could be in a caste level here, but your socioeconomic level could be up here. So, you know, everything, these are two very different systems. And so I think it's important for people to understand that one does not necessarily relate to the other. Um, your book reminded me a lot of um, the India that was represented in the Raj Quartet and that TV series. I didn't read the books, actually. I watched the TV series, and I was just like, this is so visual. This is just like that, I, and, but it's the other side. Yeah. yeah. And it, I just, I love it because um, it's just so evocative and um, beautifully done and really brings to light that whole other side of it. Yeah, thank you, Donna. And uh, do you mean by the other side, do you mean, um, you know, that that this is from the perspective of an Indian, not from the perspective of the British in India? Right, you, you never, you didn't really get that, that viewpoint there. Right. And I also thought it was interesting because that was a little bit earlier, it went up to the, to the trans, to the, um, I guess, um, to independence mm -hmm. um, and then yeah. there's that book staying on where people stayed on yeah. but you mentioned in in one of the scenes there was air conditioning and I was I was shocked I was like how could they have air conditioning in the 1950s <laughs> I was just completely blown away <laughs> why I, why wouldn't they be, have been able to have air conditioning you know the palaces had air conditioning as soon as it was allowed as soon yeah. as it came into being because you know if you are uh entertaining 
people from all over the world in your palace, of course you want to have the latest and greatest technology available. <laughs> right. It was very but, enlightening. But you know, um, I, I think that your other point is correct. And I wanted to write about my India of the 1950s because I also saw the Raj Quartet. I remember watching that series on PBS and I actually read the, the subsequent book, Staying On. And uh, I remember thinking, you know, uh, why isn't this kind of thing written by Indians? Why is it always written from the British point of view? And um, many times I think when it's written from the victor's point of view, then uh, we get a skewed idea of what the Indian people were really like. So I like the idea of being able to write primarily from an Indian point of view with 99% with Indian characters in the book because it helped me to uh, really, you know, portray Indians the way they are. You know, we're all, we're all the same all around the world, right? We're good, we're bad, we're imperfect, we make mistakes, we betray people, we are betrayed by people. Um, these are all, you know, traits that we all share. But one thing I wanted to uh, sort of call out about the Indian people in the henna artists is how resilient Indians are. And especially I think the women, how resilient women are despite this small uh, boundary that they are given to live within, they find agency, they, they find ways to get power within that tiny little boundary that they might be given. So thank you, thanks for your question. These are all great questions, by the way, I love these. Who's next? Who's got a question next? <laughs> um, someone named Ish asked, um, which language do you think in if you are bilingual, which they, they're assuming you're bilingual, do you think in English or another language? I, I think in English and I write in English and I actually also speak Italian and French because those are two places, two other places that I have lived for a period of time. and. Um, I just love learning about all kinds of cultures. I love learning about all kinds of languages. Uh, one of the greatest uh, joys of the pandemic has been how many readers are traveling through books like the henna artist, right? At a time when we can't travel, we can travel through a book and it's cheaper. <laughs> and of course, it's a lot more uh, interesting because you're getting this uh, flavor of food and uh, the smells and the sights and then the sounds of the birds, the peacocks, uh, you know, the flowers that are all around you, the topiary in the palace, the monkeys all around. Um, it's a wonderful way to, I think, experience another country. And I, I love reading about other countries. I love these kinds of books. Um, I, I read this one comment by Renee um, oh, oh, that's so sweet. Uh, the book was wonderful and listening to you has been wonderful. Your enthusiasm is contagious. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, you know, I had, I did a book club yesterday and I had somebody ask me, she said, are you a, um, an optimistic person? Because I noticed that your book ends on optimistic note and, you know, and I said, yeah, I think I am. You know, I think I am. I think as an author, um, I can go one of two ways. I can either create conflict or I can create harmony. And I like the ability to be able to create harmony. So even, even though I'm pointing out the um, injustices with the caste system, with the class system, uh, between the Indians and the British, I'm, I'm pointing these out throughout the book. Um, in very organic ways as they happen throughout the story, um, I, my goal ultimately is always to create harmony. It's always to try to help the world come together, work together, live together, as opposed to uh, creating some kind of conflict. I think the world already has enough of that. I don't need to be creating it as an author. <laughs> okay. Jackie would like to know, she said that she noticed the recipes included in the back of the book, are these your own personal recipes? 
Yes, they are. And, um, you know, I, I've never actually made henna myself. I've never actually, so one of the recipes is henna paste and I've never actually made it myself, but I've talked to so many henna artists now, I feel like I could just do it in my sleep. Uh, the, another recipe is the rubbery and my, that was my favorite dessert. It is still my favorite dessert, my favorite Indian dessert. And it takes hours and hours and hours to make. So I, I, you know, I did the recipe myself. I'm standing at the stove for two hours, two hours, three hours, just trying to make all of this cream come out on top of uh, the dessert. <laughs> so yes, that is my um, blood, sweat and tears that went into that recipe. <laughs> Looks good. I see the recipe here. Now I have a question. The cast of characters that you put in the book, was that your idea to make things a little easier for us? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I owe thanks to my agent for that one. She said, uh, you know, Alka, it would be nice if you had a cast of characters at the beginning of the book because these are all foreign names and people are going to have a hard time, you know, catching up. So I owe her thanks for that. And then it was my editor at uh, Mira Books, Harper Collins, a division of Harper Collins, uh, Kathy. She's the one who had me put the glossary in, and so I went through the whole book and tried to pick out all of the Hindi words. I don't think I got 100% of them, but um, what I was hoping is that through the context, I was very conscious of writing in such a way that even through the context, you could understand what the word might mean so that you didn't have to look it up if you didn't want to. Yeah, those were wonderful additions that other people made, uh, you know, had me make to the book, which I thought was great. And then, of course, when Mira Books said, this is going to be a big book club book, we want to make sure that book clubs, um, you know, we know that the book clubs will be very interested in this book because there's a lot to discuss. So then they had me make up a set of questions uh, and, um, you know, answers to questions and so on. So that is also something that they included, I think, in the paperback version. Yeah. Oh, the paperback of the Hannah Artist comes out in April, by the way. <laughs> Can you find those questions on your website or the HarperCollins website, probably? Well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. Can you find those questions on a website if someone has the hardcover book as opposed to the paperback? You know, um, I'm wondering where you can find that. Uh, I think you can find that mainly also on Goodreads. I think I posted them also on my Goodreads okay. site for the Hannah Great. Artist. Yeah. That's terrific. Okay, we have a question from Shanti and she says, I understand that it took over eight years to get the book reviewed and published. You had to change certain things to make it appealing to the Western readers. Is this true? And what were the changes that were made to appeal to the Western readers? I didn't have to make one change to appeal to Western readers at all. In fact, um, you know, I was kind of surprised that the only changes here, here are the major changes that different editors had me make. Uh, the first one was, uh, it happened with my literary agent when I was working with her the, those first four or five years. Um, she said that the way I had the book before, I had uh, chapter one was Lakshmi's point of view, chapter two is Radha's point of view, chapter three is Lakshmi's and then Radha and then Lakshmi and Radha and so on. And she said, I do not find Radha compelling enough to have her own viewpoint, to have her own uh, personal first person chapters. So could you please get rid of those? I had to get rid of all the Radha chapters so that Lakshmi became the focus. And now the book is all about Lakshmi's first person point of view. So now I have to figure out how to get Radha's story into Lakshmi's first person point of view because Lakshmi's not there with Radha all the time. So I had to find ways where she overheard a conversation or uh, she sort of gleaned a little something in what in Radha's appearance uh, that made her uh, you know, suspect that something was going on in Radha's life. So um, that was one major change that I had to make. Another was that at the end of the book, uh, Kathy, my editor at HarperCollins said, you know, you really need to um, think about Hari's character. He is not fully developed. Right now, the way that I'm reading the book, he is a one dimensional character. He only is mean. He is just the guy who beats up Lakshmi in their marriage. But can we see some of his humanity? Can you go deeper into his 
uh, life so that we can explore uh, what are the different parts of him, what made him the person that he is. So that was another thing that I incorporated. And of course, once I changed Hari's character, then a lot of things in the novel started changing based on how his character had developed over the years. So that was really, um, those were really the major changes I had to make. I never was asked to make this appealing to Western audiences or Eastern audiences or any kind of audience. And I think that that is a beauty of publishing. Um, the, when editors, uh, acquiring editors, when they first get your manuscript, they are not interested in whether it's going to appeal to uh, a certain kind of audience around the world. They know their readership and they know what their readership likes. And what they loved about the henna artist was it was an exotic setting. The female uh, protagonist is very strong. She is, uh, she's multifaceted. She is not perfect. She makes mistakes. And we all love characters who feel real like that to us because we can learn something from them. And then the other thing they loved was the fact that I was talking about henna. And that is an art that, you know, although it's been around for so many years, very few people have ever talked about it. And it is a self-care sort of art for women. It helps soothe and heal women. It helps them feel uh, beautiful and uh, with Lakshmi, of course. Um, it helps also, uh, it helps them achieve some of their hopes and desires. Of course, you know, regular henna art does not actually do that for you, but Lakshmi is an extraordinary character. And so what she is able to do with her art and what she can create with her henna are amazing uh, things that I had to have her uh, have the ability to do. Okay, I have a question from Neela. She said she loved the book, she would like to know what your first language is, the one you spoke at home growing up. Hindi. Hindi was my first language. And uh, it was what I spoke for the first nine years. In school was the only time that we spoke English because of those Christian nuns who were teaching us. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're Hindu, we're not Christian. Uh, but uh, we had to go to that particular school because it was the only one that was teaching English all year round. And my father definitely knew at that time that he wanted, uh, he wanted to go abroad. And so he wanted to make sure that we could speak English fluently. When we got to America, uh, it only took us probably maybe a month or two, you know, cause we're in school all day to just switch our accent over from the Queens English to American English. That was our major thing. So words like schedule, we used to say schedule instead of uh, schedule. Um, we used to say aluminum instead of aluminum, <laughs> you know, so it was just a matter of changing our accent over. But thank you for your question. Well, you did it beautifully because you speak so well. This has been fabulous. We really appreciate you speaking with us. I think there's just um, somebody says, Ish says, I love your message about creating harmony in the world. We need more of that in the world today. Oh, thank you so much, Ish. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody listening in today. It's been really lovely. I can't believe how many people are on this. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. You guys are just amazing. Thank you so much. And can I just do a little shout out to libraries while I'm here? Because, you know, because um, most authors you will find, like me, were very shy when they were growing up and they read a lot of books. And so, you know, I couldn't talk to people. I could barely talk to people without hyperventilating. Uh, that's how shy I was. And so I just read books. I, I escaped into books as much as I could. I learned about the world through books. Um, I think my English got so much better because of English, you know, uh, uh, language books that I was reading. So um, I, I have a huge debt to pay to libraries. And uh, I love all of you people who are getting the book at the library or reading any book at all at the library because it is one of the best ways that I think we uh, can learn about our world is to haunt that library. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, you know, for having me, you guys. I, I, am, I am deeply honored and deeply in gratitude to you. We thank you for writing such a wonderful book. We look forward to the two more to come and also the TV series. Marla says she's dying to read your sequel. 
which I believe you said comes out in June of 2021. Yes, that's right. And it stars Malik. And so Malik is a 20 year old who is going to be working inside the Japper Palace. Yes. Okay. So everybody stay tuned because hopefully we'll be speaking again to Alka in June of 2021. Yay. Thank you so much, Alka. We really appreciate it. And thank you everybody else for being a participant in the questions. We really appreciate everybody and keep reading. Wear <laughs> your masks. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Alka. I just have a few closing remarks. Um, okay. Thank you for joining us and Alka. Thank you again today. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of The Hannah Artist, please visit bookshop.org. If you'd like to reserve a copy at the library, please call us at 516-921-7161, extension 239, or you can reserve it through the online catalog. We have many um, upcoming virtual events this winter, so please check the newsletter and the live streaming events calendar on the Syosset Library website. Registration is not required for any of the reader services virtual programs.